Second Part, Chapter 20. In latitude, 47 degrees, 24 minutes, and longitude, 17 degrees, 28 minutes. In the aftermath of this storm, we were thrown back to the east. Away went any hope of escaping to the landing places of New York or the St. Lawrence. In despair, poor Ned went into seclusion like Captain Nemo. Consul and I no longer left each other. As I said, the Nautilus veered to the east. To be more accurate, I should have said to the northeast. Sometimes on the surface of the waves, sometimes beneath them, the ship wandered for days amid these mists so feared by navigators. These are caused chiefly by melting ice, which keeps the air extremely damp. How many ships have perished in these waterways as they tried to get directions from the hazy lights on the coast? How many casualties have been caused by these opaque mists? How many collisions have occurred with these reefs, where the breaking surf is covered by the noise of the wind? How many vessels have rammed each other? Despite their running lights, despite the warnings given by their bosun's pipes and the alarm bells, so the floor of this sea had the appearance of a battlefield where every ship defeated by the ocean lay still. Some already old and encrusted, others newer and reflecting our beacon light on their ironwork and copper undersides. Among these vessels, how many went down with all hands, with their crews and hosts of immigrants? At these trouble spots so prominent in the statistics, Cape Race, St. Paul Island, the Strait of Belle Isle, the St. Lawrence Estuary, and in only a few years how many victims have been furnished to the obituary notices by the Royal Mail, Inman, and Montreal lines, by vessels named the Solway, the Isis, the Paramata, the Hungarian, the Canadian, the Anglo-Saxon, the Humboldt, and the United States, all run aground by the Arctic and the Lionesses, sunk in collisions by the President, the Pacific, and the city of Glasgow, lost for unknown reasons in the midst of their gloomy rubble the Nautilus navigated, as if it were passing the dead in review. By May 15th, we were off the southern tip of the Great Banks of Newfoundland. These banks are the result of marine sedimentation, an extensive accumulation of organic waste brought either from the equator by the Gulf Stream's current or from the North Pole by the countercurrent of cold water that skirts the American coast. Here, too, erratically drifting chunks collect from the ice breakup. Here, a huge boneyard forms from fish, mollusks, and zoophytes, dying over it by the billions. The sea is of no great depth at the Great Banks. A few hundred fathoms at best. But to the south, there is a deep, suddenly occurring depression, a 3,000-meter pit, here the Gulf Stream widens. Its waters come to full blossom. It loses its speed and temperature, but turns into a sea. Among the fish that the Nautilus startled along its way, I'll mon mention a one-meter lumpfish, blackish on top, with an orange belly, and rare among its brethren, in that it practices monogamy. A good-sized eel pout, a type of emerald moray whose flavor is excellent, wolfish, with big eyes and a head that somewhat resembles a canine's, viviparous blennies, whose eggs hatch inside their bodies like those of snakes, bloated gobio, or black gudgeon, measuring two decimeters, grenadiers, with long tails and gleaming with a silvery glow, speedy fish venturing far from their high arctic seas. Our nets also hauled in a bold, daring, vigorous and muscular fish armed with prickles on its head and stings on its fins, 
a real scorpion measuring two to three meters, the ruthless enemy of a cod, blennies, and salmon. It was the bullhead of the northerly seas, a fish with red fins and a brown body covered with nodules. The Nautilus's fishermen had some trouble getting a grip on this animal, which, thanks to the formation of its gill covers, can protect its respiratory organs from any parching contact with air and can live out of water for a good while. And I'll mention, for the record, some little banded blennies that follow ships into the northernmost seas, sharp-snouted carp exclusive to the North Atlantic, scorpion fish, and lastly, the goad family, chiefly the cod species, which I detected in their waters of choice over these inexhaustible grand banks. Because Newfoundland is simply an underwater peak, you could call these cod mountain fish. While the Nautilus was clearing a path through their tight ranks, Consul couldn't refrain from making this comment. Mercy, look at these cod, he said. Why, I thought cod were flat, like dab or sole. Innocent boy, I exclaimed. Cod are only flat at the grocery store when they're cut open and spread out on display. But in the water, they're like mullet, spindle-shaped and perfectly built for speed. I can easily believe, Master, Consul replied. But what crowds of them, what swarms! Bah, my friend, there'd be many more without their enemies, scorpion, fish, and human beings. Do you know how many eggs have been counted in a single female? I'll go all out, Consul replied. Five hundred thousand. Eleven million, my friend. Eleven million. I refuse to accept that until I count them myself. So count them, Consul. But it would be less work to believe me. Besides, Frenchmen, Englishmen, Americans, Danes, and Norwegians catch these cod by the thousands. They're eaten in prodigious quantities. And without the astounding fertility of these fish, the seas would soon be depopulated of them. Accordingly, in England and America alone, 5,000 ships manned by 75,000 seamen go after cod. Each ship brings back an average catch of 4,400 fish, making 22 million off the coast of Norway. It's The total is the same. Fine, Consul replied. I'll take the master's word for it. I won't count them. Count what? Those 11 million eggs. But I'll make one comment. What's that? If all their eggs hatched, just four codfish could feed England, America, and Norway. As we skimmed the depths of the Great Banks, I could see perfectly those long fishing lines, each armed with two hundred hooks that every boat dangled by the dozens. The lower end of each line dragged the bottom by means of a small grappling iron, and at the surface it was secured to a boy rope of a cork float. The Nautilus had to maneuver shrewdly in the midst of this underwater spider web. But the ship didn't stay long in these heavily traveled waters. It went up to about latitude 42 degrees. This brought it abreast of St. John's in Newfoundland, and Hart's Continent, where the Atlantic Cable reaches its end point. Instead of continuing north, the Nautilus took an easterly heading as if to go along this plateau on which the telegraph cable rests, where multiple soundings have given the contours of the terrain with the utmost accuracy. It was on May 17th, about 500 miles from Hart's Continent, and about 2,800 meters down, that I spotted this cable lying on the sea floor. Consul, whom I hadn't alerted, mistook it at first for a gigantic sea snake, and was gearing up to classify it in his best manner. But I enlightened him 
the fine lad, and led him down gently by giving him various details on the laying of this cable. The first cable was put down during the years 1857 to 1858, but after transmitting about 400 telegrams, it went dead. In 1863, engineers built a new cable that measured 3,400 kilometers, weighing 4,500 metric tons, and was shipped aboard the Great Eastern. This attempt also failed. Now then, on May 25th, while submerged to a depth of 3,836 meters, the Nautilus lay in precisely the locality where this second cable suffered the rupture that ruined the undertaking. It happened 638 miles from the coast of Ireland. At around 2 o'clock in the morning, all contact with Europe broke off. The electricians on board decided to cut the cable before fishing it up. And by 11 o'clock that evening, they had retrieved the damaged part. They repaired the joint and its splice. Then the cable was resubmerged. But a few days later, it snapped again and couldn't be recovered from the ocean depths. The Americans refused to give up. The daring Cypress Field, who had risked his whole fortune to promote this undertaking, called for a new bond issue. It sold out immediately. Another cable was put down under better conditions. Its sheaved of conducting wire were insulated with a gutta-percha covering, which was protected by a padding of textile material enclosed in a metal sheath. The Great Eastern put back to sea on July 13, 1866. The operations proceeded apace. Yet there was one hitch. As they gradually unrolled this third cable, the electricians observed on several occasions that someone had recently driven nails into it, trying to damage its core. Captain Anderson, his officers, and the engineers put their heads together, then posted a warning that if the culprit were detected, it would be thrown overboard without a trial. After that, these villainous attempts were not repeated. By July 23rd, the Great Eastern was lying no further than 800 kilometers from Newfoundland when it received telegraphed news from Ireland of an armistice signed between Prussia and Austria after the Battle of Sadova. Through the mists, on the 27th, it sighted the port of Hart's content. The undertakings had ended happily. And in its first dispatch, young America addressed old Europe with these wise words so rarely understood, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to men of good will. I didn't expect to find this electric cable in mint condition, as it looked on leaving its place of manufacture. The long snake was covered with seashell rubble and bristling with foraminifera. A crust of caked gravel protected it from any mollusks that might bore into it. It rested serenely, sheltered from the sea's motions, under a pressure favorable to the transmission of what electric spark that goes from America to Europe in thirty-two one-hundredths of a second. This cable will no doubt last indefinitely, because, as observers note, its gutta-percha casing is improved by a stay in salt water. Besides, on this well-chosen plateau, the cable never lies at depths that could cause a break. The Nautilus fo followed it to its lowest reaches, located 4,431 meters down, and even there it rested without any stress or strain. Then, we returned to the locality where the 1863 accident had taken place. There, the ocean floor formed a valley 120 kilometers wide, into which you could fit Mount Blanc, without its summit poking above the surface of the waves. 
This valley is closed off to the east by a sheer wall two thousand meters high. We arrived there on May 28th, and the Nautilus lay no farther than a hundred fifty kilometers from Ireland. Would Captain Nemo head up north and beach us on the British Isles? No. Much to my surprise, he went back down south and returned to European seas. As we swung around the Emerald Isle, I spotted Cape Clear for an instant, plus the lighthouse on Fastnet Rock that guides all those thousands of ships setting out from Glasgow or Liverpool. An important question then popped into my head. Would the Nautilus dare to tackle the English Channel? Ned Land, who promptly reappeared after we hugged shore, never stopped questioning me. What could I answer him? Captain Nemo remained invisible. After giving the Canadian a glimpse of American shores, was he about to show me the coast of France? But the Nautilus kept gravitating southward. On May 30th, in sight of Land's End, it passed between the lowermost tip of England and the Scilly Islands, which it left behind to starboard. If it was going to enter the English Channel, it clearly needed to head east. It did not. All day long, on May 31st, the Nautilus swept around the sea in a series of circles that had me deeply puzzled. It seemed to be searching for a locality that it had some trouble finding. At noon, Captain Nemo himself came to take our bearings. He didn't address a word to me. He looked gloomier than ever. What was filling him with such sadness? Was it our proximity to these European shores? Was he reliving his memories of that country he had left behind? If so, what did he feel? Remorse or regret? For a good while these thoughts occupied my mind, and I had a hunch that fate would soon give away the captain's secrets. The next day, June 1st, the Nautilus kept to the same tack. It was obviously trying to locate some precise spot in the ocean. Just as on the day before, Captain Nemo came to take the altitude of the sun. The sea was smooth, the skies clear. Eight miles to the east, a big steamship was visible on the horizon line. No flag was flapping from it, the gaff of its fore and aft sail, and I couldn't tell its nationality. A few minutes before the sun passed its zenith, Captain Nemo raised his sextant and took his sights with the utmost precision. The absolute calm of the waves facilitated this operation. The Nautilus lay motionless, neither rolling nor pitching. I was on the platform just then. After determining our position, the captain pronounced only these words, It's right here. He went down the hatch. Had he seen that vessel change course and seemingly head towards us? I'm unable to say. I returned to the lounge, the hatch closed, and I heard water hissing in the ballast tanks. The Nautilus began to sink on a vertical line, because its propeller was in check and no longer furnished any forward motion. Some minutes later, it stopped at a depth of 833 meters and came to rest on the seafloor. The ceiling lights in the lounge then went out, the panels opened, and through the windows I saw, for a half-mile radius, the sea brightly lit by the beacon's rays. I looked to port and saw nothing but the immenseness of these tranquil waters. To the starboard, a prominent bulge on the sea bottom caught my attention. You would have thought it was some ruin enshrouded in a crust of whitened seashells. As if under a mantle of snow, carefully examining this mass, 
I could identify the swollen outlines of a ship shorn of its masts, which must have sunk bow first. This casualty certainly dated from some far-off time, to be so caked with limestone of these waters. This wreckage must have spent many a year on the ocean floor. What ship was this? Why had the Nautilus come to visit its grave? Was it something other than a maritime accident that had dragged this craft under the waters? I wasn't sure what to think, but next to me I heard Captain Nemo's voice slowly say, Originally, this ship was christened the Marsalis. It carried seventy-four cannons and was launched in 1762. On August 13, 1778, commanded by La Poipe Veratro, it fought valiantly against the Preston. On July 4, 1779, as a member of the squadron under Admiral Destang, it assisted in the capture of the island of Granada. On September 5, 1781, under the Count de Grasse, it took part in the Battle of Chesapeake Bay. In 1794, the New Republic of France changed the name of the ship. On April 16th of that same year, it joined the squadron at Brest under Rear Admiral Veyaret de Joyce, who was entrusted with escorting a convoy of wheat coming from America under the command of Admiral Van Stable. In the second year of the French Revolutionary calendar, on the eleventh and twelfth days of the month of Pasteur, this squadron fought an encounter with English vessels. Sir, today is June 1st, 1868, or the thirteenth day in the month of Pasteur, seventy-four years ago to the day at this very spot in latitude 47 degrees 24 minutes and longitude 17 degrees 28 minutes this ship sank after heroic battle its three masts gone water in its hold a third of its crew out of action it preferred to go to the bottom with its 356 seamen rather than surrender and with its flag nailed up on the afterdeck, it disappeared beneath the waves to shouts of, Long live the Republic! This is the Avenger! I exclaimed. Yes, sir, the Avenger. A splendid name! Captain Nemo murmured, crossing his arms. End of recording. End of chapter 20. Recorded by Trevor Strunk. Date. O three three zero zero six Troy, New York.